heard Megan talk about the 70 degree weather here. You guys are making me feel right at home. <laughs> Didn't have to pack any big coats on this trip. It is great uh, to be back here in New Hampshire and I am grateful to uh, the ACLU and UNH Law School for hosting this series uh, and for inviting me to be here to join all of you today. I'm glad to have the opportunity to introduce myself to you and to share a little bit about why I'm running for president. You know, I'm having, having the opportunity to travel to different parts of the country, uh, to gather with small groups and large groups of people. Uh, I am filled with hope and I'm inspired because even as you scroll through Twitter or you turn on the cable news or you scroll through the headlines, you see a lot of darkness, a lot of divisiveness, a lot of bad news a lot of hatred. I think sometimes we feel like it's difficult to escape this. But it is in the hearts and voices of the American people where we find our hope, where we see the opportunity to pull ourselves out of this dark hole we find ourselves in and to build this path forward to bring about the kind of real, big, systemic change that we need to see in this country. It is disheartening, and I can tell you it's disheartening from Washington, where I've served now for over six years. But I know a lot of you feel the same way that I do, to see how too often, whether it's self-serving politicians or greedy corporations or some in the media who constantly try to tear us apart, who for their own power or greed or ratings or whatever their their uh, motives may be, are trying to incite this divisiveness, to pit one group of us against the other, whether it be because of our politics, or the color of our skin, or where we come from, who we love, how we worship. All of these things that make us unique are too often in our, in our world today being used to tear us apart which is unacceptable on so many levels, but especially because it undermines our values. It undermines who we are as Americans. And it undermines this vision that our founders had for us. This vision of standing together, standing united as Americans and making sure that we have a government that is truly of the people, by the people, and for the people. These are words we have heard so often throughout our lives, right? A government of, by, and for the people. But it is that for the people that has been so forgotten. How many of you feel that our, that our government, that our leadership in Washington is truly living out that vision for the people? It's not. Instead, what we have essentially, and we see this carried out through the policies that are being passed in Washington, the things that are being talked about is really what we have as a government that is of the powerful, by the powerful, and for the powerful, while we the people get left behind. We have a government that is of the special interest, by the special interest, for the special interest, those greedy special interests and corporations who have the money to buy the lobbyists, to pay for their seat at the table, to help write the laws that will benefit them and negatively impact us. And we, the people, get left behind. This is the state of affairs that we are facing in this country right now. And this is at the heart of what needs to change. To bring these values and principles of service above self to the forefront. To make sure that our government is truly for the people. That our voices are heard that the well-being and the interests of our people and our planet are being put at the forefront of these decisions that are being made in every single part of our lives, from domestic policy to foreign policy, in every single part of our lives. Now, sometimes as we organize, as we gather around kitchen tables and in living rooms and in classrooms and workplaces, it seems like the obstacles are just too great. 
that the powers that be are so deeply entrenched, how is it possible that we can overcome? How is it possible that our voices can be heard? Really, the answer to that is that the choice is ours to make sure that our voices are heard. Because no matter how much money they have, no matter how much power they have, history shows us time and time again that there is nothing more powerful when we the people rise up and make sure that our voices are heard. When we the people stand united, motivated by this care and this love that we have for each other and for our country. And when we do that, there is no obstacle we cannot overcome. There is no obstacle we cannot overcome. When I first ran for Congress in Hawaii in 2012, I was told over and over and over again not to waste my time. Not to waste my time. There was another candidate in the race who had all the campaign money, who had all the campaign endorsements from business and labor and everybody who was somebody, as we say in Hawaii. Don't bother. Maybe come back and try again in 10 or 20 or 30 years. <laughs> That's what I was told. But you see, the mistake that they made, the political prognosticators and pundits there, was they forgot who actually decides our elections. Who really has a say? They forgot that that power lies within the hands of the people. And in that campaign, that's where I focused. And it was a tough campaign. I was virtually unknown when we began that campaign. But we worked hard, and I went to communities all across our state and every island across Hawaii asking people for the opportunity to serve them. Letting them know this was my job interview and that the decision lied with them. And we ended up overcoming all of the odds and all of the naysayers where we won that campaign in a primary, in a challenging primary, by a 22% margin of victory. Wow. So when people say that you can't challenge the establishment, you can't challenge the powers that be, you can't lift up the voices of the people I have seen in my own life, as we have seen throughout our country's history, as we have seen in the 2018 elections, how that is not the case. So we cannot underestimate the power within our own voices. And especially at a time like this, we must do the hard work. We must have the courage and the strength to stand together, to stand united, to bring about the kind of big changes we need to see to bring about the passage of legislation like Medicare for All, to make sure that every person in this country, every American, no matter how much or how little we have in our pockets, if we are sick, we are able to get the care that we need. When we stand united, we can bring about the kind of change we need to see to fix our terribly broken criminal justice system where private prisons are profiting on the backs of our brothers and sisters. Where we have a system that is working against those who walk through those prison doors, keeping recidivism rates high. When people go through and they, they do their time and they walk out, they are set up for failure from the moment they step outside those doors because the lack of services being provided that can help set them up for success. We're seeing how our continued failed war on drugs is tearing people apart, tearing families apart, ruining people's lives. I just introduced legislation in Congress a couple of weeks ago called the Ending the Federal Marijuana Prohibition Act. And this bill... <laughs> This is the only bipartisan bill in Congress that does this, that ends the federal prohibition on marijuana. My colleague, a Republican from Alaska named Don Young, was there and stood with me in leading this effort. And as we introduced the bill, we held a press conference and we invited people from uh, different parts of the community to share their stories. And so we had small business owners who are working in the cannabis industry in Washington and who are dealing with everyday wondering if the federal government will prosecute them for their 
business, which is legal in the District of Columbia, just as our businesses and people in 33 other states where some form of cannabis has been made legal. We had doctors there who were talking about how they have seen time and time again in states that have legalized some form of cannabis, a direct correlation in the reduction of opioid addiction and opioid-related deaths. So if leaders in Congress are serious about dealing with this opioid addiction, let's take this first important step and end the federal marijuana prohibition. We had a veteran there who talked about how our veterans are struggling and dealing with the fact that in the VA, whether they're dealing with post-traumatic stress or traumatic brain injury or chronic pain from combat-related injuries, doctors in the VR, VA are prohibited from giving them a referral to a cannabis dispensary for medical marijuana. So what are they left with? They're left with opioids, these highly addictive opioids. I met with a veteran in Manchester earlier today a Marine who was deployed a couple of times to the Middle East. He got blown up 29 times. He came home with severe post-traumatic stress. Got a 100% disability rating from the VA because of his injuries. And the VA was giving him these opioids. And then one day they said, OK, we think you're better. And they stopped. They stopped. What do you think happened? Heroin. Exactly. Heroin. Because like 80% of heroin addicts, they started with these opioids. And so he put it nicely as he was just telling me about his own story. He said he got into a little bit of trouble. And the fact that he had such uh, a positive and gentle outlook on things was amazing to me given what he had been through. But he was a living example of some of the problems that we continue to face. The lack of access to veterans treatment courts and drug courts and these other paths that divert people away from a criminal justice system and really what they need are just some help. There was another uh, person who attended that press conference in DC, a guy named Harry who was from Virginia, who's not an activist or an advocate. He was somebody who got a call the night before saying, hey, they're doing this press conference in DC, and I really think the country needs to hear your story. Harry's African American, college in Virginia, studying computer science, bright outlook on his life when he was arrested for marijuana possession, use. Immediately, he got two back-to-back -back mandatory minimum sentences of five years, a total of 10 years. No ifs, ands, or buts. He served 10 years in prison. He talked about his cellmate who shot someone in the chest and killed him. And his cellmate got out of prison before he did. Harry's life was completely changed because of this ongoing prohibition and this failed war on drugs. These are the people whose voices we need to hear. They symbolize those who are being impacted by these failed policies. You know, there are so many different areas that we need to address. We need to address the continued discrimination that we are seeing against our LGBTQ Americans. I posted something recently when we introduced, reintroduced the Equality Act in Congress about why it's important. And some of the social media comments, I scroll through sometimes and see what's, what's the conversation like, what are people talking about? And some people said, we don't need this anymore. This is not necessary. And then there were others who were commenting and saying, hey, yes. A friend of mine saying that she and her wife still struggled for a very long time in the state of Florida just to get a house, just to get a place to live. People were being discriminated in their places of work. There are so many examples of this discrimination that's continuing today that we have to stand united against to bring about change the Equality Act. 
bring about changes to reform our immigration system that continues to cause so much harm on so many people. Bring about changes to address climate change, to protect our environment, to make sure that we are making the need to make away from fossil fuel and renewable energy economy. This is essential for our future. None of these issues are partisan issues. I was in back earlier today where I talked with People are being poisoned by our water. And I listened to them. My heart was breaking for what they're going through, how their children are here. possible here in the United States. The cost of war. Why is this a central issue to everything else? There is a high human cost of war to change wars that we wage. We see the cost of war every single one of us. We see how every single one of us is quietly paying the price for war, whether you realize it or not. Because there are trillions of dollars, trillions of our taxpayer dollars that are coming out of our pockets to pay for these regime change wars, where we are essentially in a new Cold War with escalating tensions between the United States and nuclear armed countries like Russia and China. So see how this cost of war is essential to every other issue because unless and until we end these regime change war, this new cold war nuclear arms race, and create this peace dividend by taking the trillions of dollars we're spending on these wars and weapons and bringing it home, back into our pockets, back into our communities, back to serving the needs of our people. Unless we do this, we will not have the resources. We will not have the money that we need to make those investments. <laughs> These other urgent issues we face. This throughout history. We look back to a lot of folks from my home state who were very much affected during World War II with the mass internment of Japanese Americans. We had families in Hawaii who were literally torn apart, mothers and fathers taken from their homes, teachers taken from their classrooms, from their place of work, and shipped off to internment camps. We see how during the Cold War, the whole McCarthy era of oppression and the violation of civil liberties and constitutional rights of Americans during that time. This House Committee on Un-American Activities, investigating and surveilling and violating the civil liberties and privacies of everyday Americans. Because what? They were talking to the Russians or the, the Soviet Union or communists or are you this or are you that or and the sad part is that we're seeing a lot of the same tones in the conversations we're seeing today. Obviously, we have to look to 9-11 and what happened after 9-11 with the Patriot Act and how much of our civil liberties were violated by overreach from many of these intelligence agencies. And you look to all of these different examples and you see how in every one of them, it was our security and safety that was used as an excuse to violate our Fourth Amendment rights, to foment this climate of fear in order to allow this to happen. I'm a co-founder of the Fourth Amendment Caucus in Congress. It's a bipartisan caucus that focuses on protecting our civil liberties, on areas of the Patriot Act that violate our constitutional rights and closing them. This is something that we're continuing to focus on and continuing to do because these things are still happening. This isn't something that just happened before. And now we're in a place where we're dealing with not only overreach by intelligence agencies within our government, but also 
a violation of privacy by big tech monopolies like Google and Facebook. The point is with all of this is we cannot afford to be complacent about these freedoms that we hold dear. We cannot afford to be complacent because there are challenges and threats all the time. And so as we look at these, these challenges that we face, we see at every turn, at every uh, opportunity, the need for us to be united to bring about the kind of change that we see, the kind of change that puts the well-being of our people and our country at the forefront. We see the need for us to stand united, to bend the arc of away from war and towards peace, to make sure that we can create this path forward towards a bright future that ensures opportunity and equality and just respect for all people. This is why I'm running for president. This is not a game. This is not just politics. This is about our lives. This is about our future. It's about making sure that we have one. And that's my promise to you as president and regime change war to end this new Cold War and nuclear arms race and bring this peace dividend home to invest in our people and our future. Thank you so Um, so we have a combination of questions that are on index cards submitted from audience members, and then we'll, do, we'll take a number of questions um, from the audience directly. Great. We are going to start with one on the card that actually touches upon something that you said, which is you're, you're a great expert on privacy. Mm. If people have been paying attention to the news, Facebook dropped a pretty big announcement this week that they happened to expose hundreds of thousands of people's Instagram passwords. Um, oh. Shocking, I know. In response to that, so the question is, as president, how would you protect consumer data in this world of big tech? Yeah. Uh, this is such an important question, uh, as so much of our lives is captured online, mm -hmm. really. Uh, look, I think, w especially with these big monopolies uh, that are, are not only invading our privacy and misusing the information that we share with them, uh, we're also seeing how they crush any others who compete and try to offer other services. See this happening here in the United States as well as is happening uh, in Europe. So we need to work out uh, oversight and accountability, walking that balance uh, to make sure that government is not overstepping its boundaries, but that we are doing our job to protect people, to protect our, inf our information, to protect consumer data. Uh, so this is something that I'm looking at, seeing exactly uh, what actions need to be taken so that there is a punitive damage on companies that treat our information so lightly and not take seriously our rights and our privacy. Do you think there should be consequences for companies like Facebook that there have should these be. exposures? I think there absolutely should be. Questions from the audience. We'll go back and forth. Right here in the front row. Okay. Well, as you can see, Free press, free speech, free Julian. Free speech, free. Free press, free speech, free Julian. I know you've been outspoken right from the get go about Julian Assange's arrest. Yeah. Thank you for that. I would like you to put in your platform to pardon him, to pardon Chelsea Manning, who's already been pardoned, but who, has, as we know, has been reprisoned because he won't speak against WikiLeaks, Julian, and to pardon Snowden. I beg you to do that. Oh, I forgot, I have a microphone right here. <laughs> um, thank you, thank you both for being here and, and your shirts speaking out uh, on why we need to protect oh, our free peace. press. No, I thank you. Thank you on all fronts. Uh, look, the, let me, I just want to add a little bit to what we saw recently uh, with what happened 
uh, with Julian Assange's arrest. Uh, and I want to thank the ACLU because the ACLU was, I think, one of the lone voices speaking for freedom uh, in a whole choir of people who were cheering on his arrest and who were trying to say, distract from what was really happening by saying, look, this is about freedom of speech. This is not about freedom of the press. It's about a conspiracy charge. When we really understand the bigger picture of what's happening and how dangerous it is for our government to be in a position of creating this, this, clim this fear-based climate that whether you are a journalist or a publisher or for any of us as everyday Americans, if we put out information or if we say things or do things that the government doesn't like, then there will be consequences. It doesn't get, it doesn't get much more offensive to us as Americans have our freedom so directly undermined as that. And the reason it's the First Amendment. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. I would just like to add, I have a, a limited number. We'll get to those after the event. We'll get to the very quick. Yeah. A limited number of yeah. handouts for people who want to write letters to him. Either so Belmont we're going to move on to other questions. So during you. your opening remarks, <laughs> yeah. there was a lot of talk about ending mass incarceration and the impact of the criminal justice system. So one of the questions that's actually come up at a number of these forums is would you support restoring voting rights to those who have been formerly incarcerated? Yeah. And then the second question that's actually here is would you support allowing people in prison to vote? Uh, great questions. I think uh, to the first question, and I, I've been outspoken on this, uh, is we must restore those voting rights to those who are formerly incarcerated. Otherwise, how can, how can we say once you serve your time, once you have done uh, done your time, that we want you to come back in and enter society and get a job and, and to live a successful life, but your voice is not allowed to be heard. Uh, so that is a change that we need to see made across this country. I know there are some states that are doing this on the state by state level, but we need to see this change across the country. Uh, I have concerns about allowing uh, four votes for those who are currently incarcerated because I think it provides uh, a danger of those who are in positions of power over those who are incarcerated, whether they be prison guards or wardens or whatever, unfairly exercising or abusing their authority to try to uh, leverage their to get people to vote one way or another, to say you will vote for this party or this person or else consequences. So I think that's a danger that we've got to be concerned about uh, for those who are currently incarcerated. Other questions from the audience? We'll go right here. Thank you so much. So one in five Americans, including 19% of likely voters, are people with disabilities. Can you talk a little bit about how you would make your campaign accessible to people with disabilities? And if you're elected, how you'll make sure you, that people with disabilities are employed in your administration? Thank you very much. You know, one of the things that, that we, uh, we've started to do in our campaign uh, is to try as hard as possible to make sure that the videos that we are putting out are videos with subtitles. It takes us a little bit more time to make sure that that happens, but understand how important it is to make sure that everyone is able to, to get the message uh, that we are sending out. Uh, at different campaign events, uh, when we get RSVPs from people who say that they need a signer or need need help, then we make sure that we've got someone there who can provide that service. I think it's important as we look to our offices and, and my administration, if elected president, uh, to make sure that we are upholding um, the rights of every American and welcoming those who may have different disabilities, who have, may have different abilities, uh, and providing them and benefiting from their um, offer to serve this country. Thank you. So we have a specific question. Sure. Um, this relates to reproductive rights, which is, would you commit to lifting the Hyde Amendment and other government bans on insurance coverage for abortion services? Uh, yes. That, that is what is 
uh, already within the legislation uh, that I'm supporting uh, within Congress. Simple. We like easy. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so one thing I admire most about you is your determination to fix our broken criminal justice system. And earlier tonight, you mentioned your bipartisan legislation to end the prohibition of marijuana, which I love. Um, as President of the United States, would you support the release of inmates incarcerated for purely nonviolent marijuana charges? Yes. I like that answer. Yes. <laughs> Uh, as, as my legislation looks forward and federal marijuana prohibition, uh, we're all, I'm also a co-sponsor of legislation that would deal with those, yeah, both uh, those who have criminal records from their past and expunging those records, but we do also uh, have to address those who are incur currently incarcerated for nonviolent marijuana charges. Thank you. That was a short one. We'll go over to this side of the room. Hello, Congressman, Congresswoman <laughs> Gabbard. Hi, uh, my name is Alex and I'm an ACLU voter, which means civil rights and civil liberties are super important to me. Um, I am non-binary and genderqueer. Uh, this means my gender falls in between male and female and I use they, them pronouns. Uh, here in New Hampshire, we have two bills currently being voted on that would um, add a third gender option to birth records and state issued IDs. My question for you is, what would you do to support the recognition of American adults and children whose gender does not fit in the male or female boxes? Thank you. I think we can look to changes that are already being made. Uh, it sounds like this, these uh, bills that are before your legislature here, uh, and there are other bills that have already been passed in other states uh, to provide that recognition. I think it's something that we shouldn't just leave for the states to do, but it's something that should be done at the federal level as well. Right, you touched, you passports? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so one other question we'll have from the note cards. This goes back to criminal justice reform, which is a very reoccurring theme here. Um, but it relates to surveillance and concerns that as the, the effort towards mass incarceration picks up, that will end up replacing physical prisons with surveillance. Mm. So as president, how would you prevent surveillance from being used specifically against communities of color? Yeah, once again, you know, this comes down to uh, our, our Fourth Amendment mm -hmm. rights uh, and how there, continued, there are continued efforts to, to undermine those rights. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not personally familiar with different <coughs> proposals that are being pushed forward that accomplish what you were saying, but I think it's important for us all uh, to, to keep an eye out for those to make sure that the rights of every American um, are not being violated, that are not being undermined. And I think this is, this is the problem about the proposition that is often placed before us, is it's, it's a choice between your constitutional rights and your safety. And this is a false choice. It's not a choice that any one of us should, should have to make in this country. On that, just because I know it's in here as well and it's on the related topic, what's your position on the Patriot Act? We have to go through every single provision of the Patriot Act uh, at, to determine what needs to be taken out and repealed because it violates our Fourth Amendment rights. We need to take out those un unconstitutional provisions that we have seen already too often being used um, and abused that undermine our Fourth Amendment rights. There are a number of bills and amendments that we have pushed through in Congress, some successfully, some haven't passed, um, that seek to close those, uh, both those loopholes and get rid of those provisions that allow overreaching by the intelligence agencies, but also by some of the tech companies who build these back doors into their technology, whether it be phones or computers, that allow the intelligence uh, agencies to, to come in and collect our information without us even knowing about it. Good evening, Congressman. Good evening. Uh, you were talking earlier about the dark hole that is Washington. Right? Yeah. And, and I, I would argue that it's actually a dark tunnel of climate change. Hmm. 
And that dark tunnel, we have no idea what's coming at us from either side, and we have no idea what's at the end. There may be a point because of a catastrophic event where you would have to, to declare martial law. Hmm. How does your military training help provide you with the ability to do that fairly and equitably? That's a, that's a huge hypothetical <laughs> we're talking about here. Yeah. For a number of reasons. Um, I think my experience both as a soldier uh, and one who has been deployed to the Middle East, I have a unique appreciation for our freedoms the power that comes along with those who serve in our military, and the need for us, the responsibility that we have in government, in a civilian-led government that we have, to make sure that those powers are not being abused. I don't take lightly the fact that um, when we as service members enlist and we take an oath to serve our country, to uphold the Constitution. That's not a small thing. And so I think through my service, both in the military as well as in Congress, I would have a unique ability to be able to strike that balance to make sure that ultimately a, there's not a violation of our constitutional rights. Good <laughs> Other questions from the audience? I want to try and get up higher levels here. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, a couple other campaigns are beginning to advocate for universal basic income. Mm. I'm wondering what your thoughts are on that, if that's something your campaign's yeah. looked at, you know, perhaps yeah. um, ending some of the wars in the Middle East, you might have additional uh, monies in that yeah. Really yeah, no, thanks for your question. It's something that I am currently looking at. Uh, I think there's, there's a lot of potential and opportunity uh, to address, sorry, the question was about universal basic income and whether or not that's something that, that we're considering. It is something I'm considering and doing my research to, to see and understand um, what all the ramifications would be, pros and cons, cost, uh, to look to see how we could potentially use it to eliminate some of the costs that go towards bureaucracies and empower people. So stay tuned on that one. Other questions? Hi, thank you for coming. Thank you. So we have a really divided country right now. And I really liked what you said before about rising up and taking our government back. Yeah. But I would maintain that there are a lot of people in this country who said, we rose up and took our government back, and that's why we voted for Donald Trump. <laughs> so what would you say to those people? What would you do to try and unite our country? Yeah. I think it's important for us to not further deepen those divides that we, f that we see exist right now in our country that really fall between those who voted for this president and those who voted against him. Because as I've found through different communities that I've gone through, uh, different people that I've met, I've met people and I know people who voted for Donald Trump. And rather than just writing them off as the others, or the other team, or the enemy, or the opposition, or whatever it may be, the only way we can come together in this country is by building those bridges and having those conversations that are based on respect. And actually listening to each other. <laughs> Recognizing that there are a lot of different reasons why people vote the way they do, whether we agree with the way they vote or not. In order for us to be able to make progress in this country, we have to better understand each other. And there were a lot of people who voted for Donald Trump because they were afraid, dealing with threats on their own economic security, their ability to provide for their family. People who voted the way they did because they feel like they've been completely left behind. They have not been heard. Democrats who voted for President Obama twice, then voting for Donald Trump. How does that make sense? We won't know unless we have these conversations and hear about the problems and concerns and fears
that people have in this country and hear their voices and then say, okay, you and I might agree on a few issues or a number of issues or one issue. We may disagree on many others, but we can respect each other. We can disagree without being disagreeable and recognize that as Americans, we have to come together. We have to bring our country together to move forward. Otherwise, we will remain in this perpetual state of one side against the other side, arrows pointed at each other, making no progress on any of these issues. So many of the issues we've talked about this evening have bipartisan support. People on all ends of the political spectrum are very concerned about. Criminal justice reform being a perfect example. If we allowed ourselves to remain in our opposing camps, we would not be able to see the kind of progress we are seeing now on criminal justice reform with the passage of the First Step Act in Congress, where we have the ACLU has been a tremendous leader on this issue. And working with, working with very conservative organizations, setting differences on many other issues aside and saying,